Well, we are going to be in the book of Matthew once again. Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 19 through 34. Jesus, as he gives his disciples three warnings, three don'ts, and a do. He's going to warn his disciples about not storing up excessive wealth, being careful with your eyes, and be careful not to try to serve two masters. And then he goes into don't, don't worry. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to wear or what you're going to eat. Because our Heavenly Father knows what's best for us. Jesus, when he's sitting down and he's teaching his disciples, uh, can we get that slide of the, uh, there you go. Oh, yep. There you go. Very rugged, over the Sea of Galilee, sitting there teaching his disciples, what does it mean to be a true disciple? What does it mean to have a mindset, keeping your mind fixed on the kingdom? And so as he sits here and he's teaching them, he wants to make sure that they don't separate the, the spiritual and the physical. Because oftentimes people put them in two different categories in their mind. There's the spiritual and the physical. And Jesus is saying, no, it's all one and the same. As we were going through and we were, were looking at when you give, when you uh, pray, and when you fast, these are things, these are physical things that do affect the spiritual. And now coming in, and as we look at these warnings, these don'ts and this do, Jesus is, is, is speaking once again, keep your eyes on Jesus. Make sure that He is your example. Make sure that He is uh, what you're measuring your life up to. Don't be looking at other Christians trying to measure yourself up to them because you're either going to look really good or really bad. And ultimately, we want, we all need to be bad. We're all bad. <laughs> when you measure yourself up to Christ, Jesus, He's perfect. We're not. And so it's make sure your eyes are on Jesus. And so I just want to pray and ask the Lord that he would anoint this time, that he would bless this time as we study his word. So Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, time that you have uh, allowed us to come. Lord, thank you for the day and age that we're living in. We're living in such exciting times. Lord, they're dark. They're evil times, but we know, Lord, that where darkness abounds, grace abounds all the more. So, Lord, we just want to sense your presence here, your grace, your love. I pray that you, Lord, would just be glorified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 19, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is making it very clear in a lot of his parables that we are to have an attitude towards material possessions as it reflects our spiritual state. The Pharisees were oftentimes called hypocrites by Jesus. These pretenders because they would say one thing and do a completely different thing, what they were saying. These Pharisees were covetous. They saw, they wanted, and they used their influence in the religion of Judaism to allow them to get money, to pretty much steal the money from the people. There was temple tax. They wouldn't allow that dirty Roman money to come in. No, you got to exchange that. Oh, no, you can't bring little lammy. You got to give us little lammy, pay some extra money, and we'll give you one of our temple lambs. Extortion. They were stealing from the people. 
If our attitude, though, is to glorify God, then we will have a proper attitude towards wealth, our, our material things. Jesus is not saying you shouldn't have a savings account. You, you shouldn't save up for nice things. God, <laughs> he's not saying that at all. Being poor does not make you any more spiritual. God created all things, and when they are, these things are held on to in a way that glorifies God, then he says it's good. God created all things, and he said it was good. It is God who has given us richly all things. The first verse is 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Everything we have... God is like, I want you to enjoy it. So don't feel bad about having a comfortable couch. Enjoy that comfortable couch after work or on a Sunday afternoon. No better feeling after church, on the couch, relaxing. God is good. It is not, and this quote by Warren Wearsby, it is not wrong to possess things, but it is wrong for things to possess you. End of quote. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. There are those who just love money, and they'll try whatever it, they do to will themselves to have riches. And I, I have talked to people who have dreams. I had a dream that God wants me to be rich. He wants me to have a Mercedes. I had a guy tell me Mercedes are spiritual somehow. I just... <laughs> yeah. When our greed for money comes into effect, we can turn our mind to justify almost anything. It will never be enough money in your life. It just there's always when the, your love of money, when you worship money, it's never going to be enough. When money is your god, it's just it's insatiable. I can't get enough. But we don't want to store up treasures here on earth only. We need to have that heavenly mindset. God has a plan, and it's not going to finish here on earth. <laughs> it's up above. So let's have minds that are fixed upon up above. Um, Greg Glory often will say, you will never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It won't happen. Many people would desire to bring their wealth with them after they die, but they can't. You look at ar archaeology and dig up all these tombs of kings, and, and oftentimes you would find they had put all their treasure in there, some armor, and oftentimes wives or concubines, sadly. I have this joke that I heard that I thought it was funny about a man who wanted to bring some of his wealth with him after he died. This man, finding out that he has terminal cancer, he went to three of his friends. One was a pastor, one was a doctor, and the other one was a lawyer. He gave each $30,000 in cash, and he said, Hey guys, at my funeral, while they're lowering my casket down into the ground, will you throw this money into my casket with me so I can have a little bit of spending cash up there in heaven? The friends agreed to it. So the time comes, the man dies, and at his funeral, the three friends throw their envelopes into the casket as it was being lowered down. As they walked away, the pastor says, I can't take it anymore. The guilt! I only threw $20,000 in the casket. The church needed repairs. The roof was leaking. The doctor goes, oh good, I'm so glad you said something. I only threw $10,000 in. The clinic needed new equipment. 
the lawyer turns to them and, and says, I'm ashamed of you guys. How can you take this man's money? And the pastor and the doctor turn to the lawyer and say, you really put all the money in the coffin? And the lawyer says, I certainly did. I wrote him a personal check for the whole thing. <laughs> We can't take our earthly possessions with us. They're going to be left behind someday. This life is temporal, so let's have a heavenly mindset. But what does it mean to lay up for ourselves treasure in heaven? It means that we should do things for the glory of God. It's a heart issue. What is the motive of your heart? Is it to be seen by men? Or is it to be seen by your heavenly Father? Where our treasure is, our heart will also be there. Where, is our in, where have we invested our time? Where have we invested our talents and treasures? Have we invested in our marriages? Have we invested in people around us? Have we invested our treasure in, in spiritual things? Because if we do, if we do pour into our marriages, if we do pour into our children, our grandchildren, and, our, and the people around us, then what's going to happen? Our heart's going to follow. Our heart is going to follow. And I think that, I don't want to go back to the whole tithing thing. But I think by giving to the church, it's like, ah, this is my church. You know, I'm here. I thank the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I don't want to beat that horse, but where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And then we go, and, and the second warning is the warning of the eye. The, and in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye, and if there your eye is good, then your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Once again, Jesus is warning not to separate the physical and the spiritual. If we are looking and focusing on evil things, then our spirit will be hindered. Proverbs 27.20 20 says, Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Never satisfied are the eyes of man. So we got to be careful. What are we looking at? What are we spending our time focusing on, meditating? If we think that we could be looking at smut and have a deep relationship with God where He is using us in a powerful way to influence our community in this, this nation, then we're sadly mistaken. God loves us. His love will never end. But that union, that connection that we have, we can break it. We can separate ourselves from God. Pulling us from God in that, that wonderful, intimate relationship where God is close. Jesus did not complain about the nails being drove through his hands and feet. But the moment he did not feel that connection with his heavenly father, he screamed out, Father, why have you forsaken me? That was the deepest pain that Jesus had ever experienced. If you <laughs> did not wake up one day and did not sense God's presence, would that hurt you? Would that bother you? Would that break your heart? Would you cry out, God, where are you? Or is that something that we've all gotten too comfortable with? But if our eye is bad, which means evil or unhealthy, then the result is this physical and spiritual restriction. Our spiritual connection to God can be hindered by what we are looking at. So let's make sure we say, be careful, little eye, what you see. <laughs> be careful, little eye. Because your Father up above is... Verse 24, no one can serve 
two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and riches. We can't serve two masters at the same time. It's impossible. We'll either serve Jesus or possessions, money, riches, wealth, glory. The world, the flesh, and the material possessions, these things are terrible masters. God made us to be servants. And we can either serve sin or we can serve God. One leads to death and the other one leads to life. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin, what your payment, how sin pays you. <laughs> Here's your wages for being my servant. It's death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. If God gives you riches and we use them for his glory, then riches are a blessing. It can be a blessing to yourself, but to others as well. A sign that you have started serving the other master, sin, riches, rather than serving God, is you start being turned off by the things of God. Do you have a desire to talk with God? Do you have a desire to read the Word of God? Do you have a desire to fellowship amongst other believers? Is this desire is waning, is, is, is going away, then you might be serving the wrong master. We need to check our hearts. Because we can have a, a tendency to wander. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Leaving God, leaving His love is the worst thing we can do. All it does is bring torment to ourselves. We might be able to satisfy ourselves with the passing pleasures of sin, but they're passing, they're passing pleasures. They will never satisfy fully. It will always come to the end, come to the destruction. And now we come into the, the three don'ts. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I wonder, if, is that Bob Marley? Did he read this, maybe, and write that song? In verse 25 through 34, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value, value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? And this cubit is 18 inches. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows what you need. All these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus commands his disciples not to worry about three things. Their life, their clothing, their food. You might be thinking, hey, those are some big things. <laughs> they concern me. 
especially with our economy. The English word worry comes from an, uh, an old German word, and I have that next, next slide. Did I not put it in? Sorry, it, it would have already been there. Ah, oh, there it is. Is it out of order? I'm sorry. The English word worry comes from an old German word that means to strangle or to choke. And the Greek word used here in verses 25, 28, 31, and 34 means to be anxious or troubled. Worry, the Greek word worry, anxious, or troubled. God, who loves you, does not want you walking about your life anxious or troubled. God doesn't want you to worry, to choke out the joy that God has for you. He's going to give us five reasons why we should not worry. One, life is more than these things. Verse 25. Isn't life more than these things? More than just the basic necessities of life? The answer is yes. We can waste so much time. Wake, uh, I love this saying, majoring on the minors. We can make small things big things. Worrying about the small things. And they become these big things. They overwhelm us. And God's saying, hey, life is more than the small things. The, the basic necessity of life. Focus on the big things, the eternal things, the heavenly things. Number two, worry does not help. Worrying does not make you taller or add years to your life. If that was true, if worry made you taller, I would be very tall. Obviously, it doesn't make you taller. <laughs> All worry does is it pulls you apart piece by piece. It steals from the peace that God would give to you. Life is more than our basic necessities and worrying about it. All it will do is nothing. <laughs> it won't help our situation at all. Number three. That is what the unbelievers do. Verse 32. So when Jesus uses the term Gentiles, he's not referring to their ethnicity, but their spirituality. They're unbelievers. Unbelievers worry about the, the basic things. They got to have the next best shoe, the best, the best next car. You know, uh, in South Carolina, what I, is so interesting about South Carolina is you will have in a rundown trailer park the nicest cars. Every time you got a mansion, beat up truck. You got this trailer. You got these sports cars, brand new truck. I always thought it was just funny. Um, yeah, I don't know. Worrying for someone that does not know God makes, us, makes sense because they have to put their trust in money. That's all they have. They don't have a heavenly father. Thinking these people, these unsaved people thinking that riches will solve their problems when in re reality riches create more problems. Wealth gives a dangerous sense of security and in reality oftentimes it just brings tragedy. Fourthly, we have to have a heaven we have, sorry, four, we have a heavenly father. Unlike the unbelieving world, we have a heavenly dad to turn to in times of need. My father-in-law, when he went to Bible college uh, in the early, well, he went to Bible college three times. <laughs> the third time he went to Bible college, well, seminary, uh, he, he, had a, he had four kids and Gracie was on the way. And he needed to rent a house and the guy in Southern California would not rent them a house. 
and uh, his credit was, was not up to the, the standard that they wanted. And so the guy's like, oh, come on, you got more money, you know, can you get more collateral and all this stuff? And my father in goes, no, but I do have a very wealthy father. My father-in-law doesn't know his father, but he has a very wealthy, heavenly father. He got the house. <laughs> God can take care of us. We can turn to him in times of need. We don't have to turn to worry. Don't let worry be your little pal. He will feed us. He will clothe us. But sometimes our our little faith hinders him from working as he would. He has great blessings in store for us if we would just trust in him. Those blessings uh, may not be health and wealth. But if your eyes are fixed on God and he gives you his heart, then the things that you desire will be of God. And when he gives them to you, things of God, more of his spirit, then it will be a blessing. We also, he also takes care of us. I mean, he does. We have a great Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. This Greek word for knows is koida. And know, it means to, it knows and understands. God is not a God that's far off, that our problems seem small to him. Go, oh, you, you little ant, your little problems. No, he knows intimately. He cares. But he's a good heavenly father. He knows what we need. Not, not necessarily what we... He knows what we want. Because we have a habit of asking. <laughs> Lord, I really want this. I really want this. Son or daughter, maybe that's not the best for you. Maybe it's a no because it's good for you to have a no. A mindset. If my daughter would come to me one day and say, Daddy, I'm worried. Why are you worried, Gianna? I don't, I'm afraid that you can't provide a, a, a roof over my head or food for tonight. Two things would happen. Wow, you're talking. <laughs> the other thing would be, I'm offended. I've worked hard to provide a house, uh, a roof over your head. I want to make sure you have food. Or my wife has. <laughs> but when we come to God and we're like, God, I don't know if you're big enough for this. I don't know if you're big enough for this problem. God's like, are you kidding me? I spoke the world. I spoke the universe into existence. These problems are not too big, and my care for you is not too small. I care for you, God says. I love you with an everlasting love. Fifth thing, we borrow our fears from the future. Verse 34. Jesus wants his disciples to know life is more than worrying about the future. Jesus is not saying, don't plan for the future, but for us not to worry about the future. Proverbs 16.9, a, um, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. God is a God that he cares. And as we go to the Lord and go, okay, Lord, you've put this on my heart. Maybe a move. Uh, to go somewhere, do something. Someone's put, been put on your heart. You pray. Plan. Don't, don't. We're not called to boast in our arrogance. <laughs> I'm not going to plan tomorrow because God's got it. God wants you to have a plan. But he wants you to hold on to that plan loosely. Let him change that plan, if necessary. A study on worrying was done, and it found that 91% of worries 
were false alarms. And the remaining nine of the worries that did come true, the outcome was better than expected. About one in, th uh, one, about one in thir a third of the time. For about one in four participants, exactly zero of their worries materialized. Most of the time what we're worried about doesn't even happen anyways. We wasted a lot of time. I call my worries war games, so I can justify them. What would I do if a burglar broke in? Where's the gun? Would I go for the dog? Theo, get him! <laughs> I go through all these things. When my wife and I were first married, uh, I did it all the time. You know, hey, there's a guy over there on the other side of the room. We're at a restaurant, and I'd be like, he's suspicious. He's suspicious, what do you mean? <laughs> yeah, so if he does this, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna go here, and now Gracie's like, I'm worried, I can't eat. Like, <laughs> I, I, be careful of not justifying your worries, calling it something else. We can oftentimes make our worries our little pet, our little friend, we come to actually love your little worries. They're your little friends. We gotta say no. Are you more familiar with your worries than the Spirit of God? Do you expect things to go wrong more of the time than God to move in His power and His might? What are you expecting? Have a mind that is expecting God to move in a powerful way. The do. What are we supposed to focus on? Seek first. The kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these little worries, all these little cares, all these little things you've been dreading shall be added to you. God says instead of investing in this life alone, instead of only having your eyes on the physical, instead of trying to have two masters, and instead of worrying, we are to seek first the kingdom of God. If we put God's desires and God's righteousness first in our lives, well, he'll take care of everything else. Seeking first the kingdom of God shouldn't merely be something on our to-do list. But it should be our greatest desire to see God as our number one priority. Don't make your prayer life a routine, a mindless act. Sometimes you can find yourselves in that all rut where you just pray the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. God says, I want to do a new thing in your life. Can you get all over all this? Can you just stop? Just get your eyes on me and I can pour a fresh spirit into you so you start seeing a bigger thing in a bigger way? Don't be so narrow-minded. God wants to do great things in your life. It's never too late. Abraham had to be a, almost 100 years old before God could give him the promised son. Why? So he wouldn't take any of the glory. Gideon. 10,000 was too many. Had to get down to 300 so that they wouldn't take the glory. Don't take the glory. Get your eyes on God and say, God, will you do something big? I'm trusting in you. And he'll make it clear. When he does a work in your life and it's him, he wants to make it clear that it was him. So you don't get the glory. There are too many people that the Spirit of God has left. 
because of their sin, because of their disobedience. But those people still can seem mighty religious, mighty spiritual, but it's all lip service. They give praise to God, but it's not going anywhere. The children of Israel constantly, it says, that they were coming into the temple of God. They would say, we're at the temple of the God, temple of God. Praise, we're at the temple of God. And God's like, this is all so dumb. Why? Because you're going to walk out that door. You're going to walk out those gates. You're going to walk on top of a hill and worship other gods. What you're doing right here is lip service. Quit it. Seek me. Seek me with all of your heart. Lean not on your desires, your will. And when you do, when you seek God, I lay it all down at your feet. Then the thing that is replaced with worry is peace and joy. Joy unspeakable. Joy that all you can do is just sing. And in those moments of singing and praise... They're wonderful. Wonderful. But we're prone to wander. Time and time again, prone to wander. And it is confession and forgiveness. Lord, please come into my life. Cleanse me. I see my sin. How it has pulled me away from you. Give me the grace to overcome what I cannot overcome on my own. And as God does, as He purifies us, as we draw, He draws us closer and the joy of the Lord comes in, thank Him. Thank you, Lord. As He blesses you financially, physically, thank you, Lord. And it might just be for a moment. Some, some people have chronic pain. And you pray, Lord, can you please just give me a moment without pain? God might grant you a moment. Praise Him for the moment. This pain, this suffering is not going to last forever. Heaven is just around the corner. Either the rapture, I mean our life is but a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. Soon you're going to be in the presence of God, worshiping Him with joy unspeakable. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much Lord, for your love for us. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your joy that surpasses all understanding. Lord, I pray that you would just bless each person here. I just pray, Lord, that Lord, we would see our sin. We would repent of our sin, that we would turn from our sin, and that you, Lord, would be the only thing we desire, the only thing we see. I pray that you would go before each person's week, Lord. Lord, grant them safety. Fill them with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need prayer, uh, please come up, and uh, one of us would love to pray for you. God bless. Please stand.